Honorable Ministers, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good afternoon. I call to order the third plenary meeting of the fourth session of the United Nations Environment Assembly. Before starting the afternoon segment of the national statements, I would like to invite the President of the Staff Union of the United Nations in Nairobi to address the Assembly. Please, Mr. Martin and Johindu, you have the floor. Thank you. Your Excellencies, <clears throat> President of United Nations Environment Assembly, Government Representatives, Ministers, Members of Committee of Representatives, Heads of Delegations and Participants, all protocols observed. On behalf of all United Nations staff members, I have the honor to welcome you to the 4th United Nations Environment Assembly here in Nairobi. As we play host to this all-important event in United Nations environment and indeed UN calendar, we wish to reaffirm our commitment to the United Nations General Assembly mandate entrusted to the staff members. Our gratitude to all governments and citizens attending the assembly, and we look forward to your commitment towards meeting your obligations, including creating an enabling environment to meet the global challenges specifically reflected by the theme this session, innovative solutions for environmental challenges and sustainable consumption and production. We take this opportunity to welcome Ms. Amina Mohammed, the Deputy Secretary General, Ms. Inga Anderson, the incoming Executive Director of UN Environment, to Nairobi Duty Station, the only UN headquarters located in the Global South. Special thanks to Ms. Joyce Musuya for her role as the Acting Executive Director of UN Environment. We also extend our regards to our host, Ms. Maimuna Sharif, Acting Director General of UNON and the Executive Director of UN Habitat, Karibuni, Nairobi. I thank Mr. Njohiju for his statement. We will now continue with our session of the national statements. Our order of this session is as set out in the speaker's list. Should you need to consult the list, our conference room officer will be of assistance. Before I invite our first speaker, I want to remind our delegates that during yesterday's plenary session, it was decided that a timer would be set in front of the speaker on the left in order to monitor the allocated time of three minutes while speaking. Secondly, the microphone will automatically turn off after the allotted speaking time and a small grace period. I urge all delegates to exhibit restraint and make your statement within the allotted time. Please be informed that a video and a written text of statements made will be published on the website of the Environment Assembly. On this note, I would like to remind delegates that have not yet sent their statements to the Secretariat to do so now. It's now my honor to invite Her Excellency, Ms. Carolina Schmidt, Minister of Environment, to take the floor. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Uh, muy buenas tardes a todos los presentes. Quiero comenzar expresando nuestro profundo pesar de todo el Estado de Chile por el accidente aéreo 
que ocurrió el domingo pasado y la pérdida de tantas vidas humanas. Nuestro cariño y afecto a sus familias, a los estados de Kenia y Etiopía y a todos los países y organizaciones que perdieron a sus compañeros de eh, trabajo en esta tragedia que sin duda nos enluta a todos. Asimismo, quiero mandar un cariñoso cariño a la embajadora de Zambia y hacer los votos para que se recupere prontamente. Hoy, en el mundo entero, enfrentamos un reto de enormes proporciones. Transformar nuestro modelo global de desarrollo en uno que aspire a la generación de residuos cero. En este proceso de transformación hay desafíos que nos demandan gran sentido de urgencias. Quizás el mayor de todo es el cambio climático. Para combatirlo necesitamos decisión y ambición en la acción climática que permita desarrollar un modelo de crecimiento que nos permita alcanzar el 100% de carbono neutralidad. Por otra parte, Enfrentamos el desafío de la contaminación y la enorme generación y acumulación de residuos que están enfermando hoy a nuestro planeta. Debemos cambiar nuestra manera de pensar desde una economía lineal a una economía circular. Sin duda, enfrentamos un momento crucial para la humanidad y la preservación del medio ambiente para las futuras generaciones. Los informes del mundo científico son claros en mostrar que debemos cambiar. Hemos vivido históricamente como si el mundo tuviera una capacidad infinita para recibir desechos y como si todos los recursos naturales fueran inagotables. Hoy sabemos con certeza que eso no es así. El mensaje entonces es claro. Debemos dejar atrás la mirada de lo desechable y buscar estrategias de crecimiento que nos permitan reutilizar y reconvertir las materias primas. En Chile ya nos hemos embarcado en un proceso de transformación hacia una circularidad y economía más limpia, mediante el inicio de un programa integral de consumo y producción sustentable que tiene tres líneas de acción. Empresas sustentables, consumidor informado y sector público sustentable. Son tres actores clave si queremos avanzar justamente en esta dirección. La línea de empresas sustentables busca generar políticas públicas que incentiven al sector productivo a transitar hacia la economía circular. El sector privado y el mundo empresarial es el gran generador de la innovación y las nuevas tecnologías. Impulsar, por lo tanto, políticas que incentiven su conversión es fundamental para avanzar más rápido. Un pilar esencial para esto es la Ley de Responsabilidad Extendida del Productor, más conocida como la Ley REP, gracias a la cual estamos generando un cambio cultural profundo en nuestra mentalidad y en la acción empresarial, impulsando nuevos hábitos y la obligación de reutilización revalorización y reciclaje en el sector privado. En Chile generamos 17 millones de toneladas anuales de residuos. Esto es 1,1 toneladas por persona al año. Hoy reciclamos en Chile menos del 10% de esa cantidad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Your Excellency. May I now invite His Excellency Mr. Abur Gaber Saeed, Secretary General, Higher Council of the Environment, to deliver his statement. You have the floor. Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bi ismi dawlat al-Sudan. Nuhayi al-Sayyid Raees al-Jam'iyya al-Amma al-Rabi'a lil-Umma al-Muttahida al-Biya. 
والتحية تنداح أيضا كذلك للسادة وزراء البيئة ورؤساء الوفود والسادة المندوبون الدائمون لدى برنامج الأمم المتحدة للبيئة السيدات والسادة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أود في البدء أن أتقدم بخالص التعازي لأسرة الأمم المتحدة وأسرة ضحايا حارسة الطائرة الأسوبية يوم الأحد المنصرم نسأل الله أن يتقبلهم جميعا بقبول حسن وأن ينزلهم منزلا مباركا مع الشهداء والصدقين السيد الرئيس إنه من دواعي سروري وشرفي أن أخاطبكم في هذا الاجتماع الاجتماع الرابع للجمعية العامة للأمم المتحدة الذي ينعقد تحت شعار حلول مبتكرة للتحديات البيئية وإنتاج واستهلاك مستدامين أخي الرئيس لقد كان اختيارنا لهذا الشعار موفقا في عالم اليوم الذي توحد المكان فيه فأصبح بفضل الله تعالى ثم بفضل التكنولوجيا والابتكار غرية صغيرة بل بيتا صغيرا مما يحتم ضرورة وحدة سكانه من خلال بناء وتصور أنظمة تقنية واجتماعية أفضل ذلك أن تطوير التكنولوجيا وإطفاء الحيوية والطابع المؤسسي عليها أصبح جوهر التنمية البشرية والاقتصادية والبيئية لا سيما في المجتمعات والبلدان التي ظلت منذ فترة طويلة بعيدة عن تحقيق رخاؤها وكرامتها وعليه أخي الرئيس أن مجتمع نامي ناشل للتطور يجب أن يزعى إلى تحقيق الاستغلال التكنولوجي في سعيه لتحقيق التحولات الإيجابية والازدهار لشعبه بصورة تسهم في توجيه وتنفيذ القرارات المتعلقة بالإنتاج والاستهلاك المستدامين وكذا تطويع خدمات التكنولوجيا في ابتكار حلول ناجعة للتحديات السيدات والسادة إن مصطلح البيئة عندنا في السودان يعني الحياة ويعني الاقتصاد ويعني المجتمع واستقرار التنمية في السودان تعتمد على البيئة والموارد الطبيعية التي تتأثر بدورها بالتدهور البيئي لذلك فإننا في السودان نتعامل مع هذا الأمر كأهمية غصوى وفي هذه وفي هذا الصدد فأنه يمكن تلخيص أهم التحديات البيئية في السودان في الآتي واحد التأثير السالب للتغييرات المناخية على الاقتصاد الريفي والمجتمعات التقليدية وبالطبع فإن هذا يؤثر على الاقتصاد الكلي وحياة الناس في السودان كما أن الجفاف Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you, Excellency. I thank His Excellency for his statement. May I now invite His Excellency Mr. Khalil A. Tagafi, President of the General Authority of Meteorology and Environmental Protection to make his statement, to deliver his statement. You have the floor. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ma'ali Sayyid Sam Kizr, Rais al-Dawr al-Rabi'a al-Jamiya al-Amumiya al-Bi'a, Wazir al-Bi'a al-Jamuri al-Tistoni al-Sadiq, Ashab al-Ma'ali wa al-Sa'ada wa al-Sa'ad al-Hud, Sayyidat wa al-Sa'ada, Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Awaddu bidaya. بالنيابة عن حكومة المملكة العربية السعودية والإصالة عن نفسي 
والوفد السعودي المشارك في الدورة الرابعة الجمعية العمومية للبيئة والاجتماع الوزاري المصاحب له أن أتقدم بأحر التعازي لذوي ضحايا الطائرة المنكوبة وأتقدم بجزيل الشكر والتقدير لبرنامج الأمم المتحدة للبيئة ولجنة الممثلين الدائمين سي في آر على الإعداد الجيد لهذا الاجتماع والشكر موصول لممثلي الدول الأعضاء الذين عملوا طولة الأسبوع المنصرم على التحضير لمشاريع القرارات المقترحة اعتمادها بهذه الدورة كما أن في المملكة العربية السعودية نأخذ بعين الاعتبار أهمية القرارات الصادرة عن الجمعية العمومية للبيئة في دورتها السابقة ونرحب بمشاريع قرارات الدورة الرابعة تحديدا المتعلقة بالأمن الغذائي والمحافظة على البيئة البحرية والحد من النفايات البلاستيكية وكذلك مشاريع القرارات ذات العلاقة بالمواد الكيميائية والنفايات الخطرة وتلوث الهواء والتي تدعو إلى إجراءات ملموسة على الصعيدين الوطني والعالمي لتنفيذ أهداف التنمية المستدامة المتعلقة بالبيئة والتنوع الحيوي وخدمات النظم الإيكولوجية وتطوير وتنمية الاستثمارات الصديقة للبيئة معالي الرئيس أصحاب المعالي السعادة الحضور الكرام تود المملكة العربية السعودية للتأكيد على أهمية شعار الإعلان الوزاري لهذه الدورة حلول مبتكرة للتحديات البيئية والاستهلاك والإنتاج المستدامين والتي تتناغم رؤية المملكة عشرين ثلاثين من خلال محاور الرؤية الثلاث وطن طموح واقتصاد مزدهر ومجتمع حيوي تلك الرؤية التي بدأت المملكة فعليا بتنفيذها من خلال رسم الخطط والاستراتيجيات الوطنية وتنمية الاستثمار المستدام لحماية البيئة والتغلب على التحديات البيئية وتعزيز الانتاج والاستهلاك المستدامين إن وفد بلادي يدعو من هذا المنبر إلى تكثيف الجهود على الصعيد العالمي لتبادل الخبرات ونقل المعرفة للمساهمة في تمكين الدول من التصدي للتحديات البيئية وعقد الشراكات لتحقيق التكامل الذي يضمن تنفيذ البعد البيئي لجدول أعمال الأمم المتحدة 2030 وأهداف التنمية المستدامة ختاما أتمنى لهذا الاجتماع النجاح بإصدار قرارات تصب في تحقيق أهداف الجمعية العمومية للبيئة وتحقيق مزيد من التآزر والتعاون مع منظمات الأمم المتحدة ذات العلاقة بالمحافظة على البيئة ومكوناتها والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I thank His Excellency Mr. Tahir Al-Taghafi for his statement and may I now invite His Excellency Mr. Joseph Jote, Minister of Environment, Haiti, to make his statement. Mr. Minister, you have the floor. Monsieur le Président, distingués délégués et représentants des États membres, Mesdames, Messieurs, au nom du Président et du gouvernement de la République d'Haïti, je voudrais commencer mes propos en présentant mes condoléances au gouvernement éthiopien et aux familles victimes du tragique accident de Ethiopian Airlines qui a causé la mort à 157 personnes dont la plupart devraient participer à cette importante assemblée. Permettez-moi aussi de remercier le gouvernement du Kenya pour l'excellent accueil et toutes les facilités qu'ils ont accordées aux membres de la délégation haïtienne pour permettre leur participation à cette quatrième assemblée des Nations Unies sur l'environnement. Monsieur le Président, Mesdames, Messieurs, si Haïti s'est fait un point d'honneur pour participer à ces assises, c'est parce que les questions en débat sont de la plus haute importance pour notre pays. En effet, nous sommes un petit État insulaire en poids à des problèmes de différentes natures et l'avenir de millions de femmes et d'hommes dépend de la manière dont nous nous prenons pour faire face. Car nous sommes bien conscients que par rapport à l'acuité de ces problèmes, il faut œuvrer fermement et résolument dans une voie qui permette de répondre aux besoins actuels de nos compatriotes sans pour autant compromettre les désidératas des générations futures. La question de la consommation et de la production durable en débat au cours de cette UNEA nous interpelle à un moment 
où notre pays fait face à de sévères crises environnementales, avec des répercussions sur différents secteurs de la vie nationale. Nous savons que ce problème ne se limite pas aux frontières haïtiennes et touche aussi d'autres nations. Fort de cette considération, la question réside dans la façon dont nous devons agir pour aider nos pays respectifs à répondre durablement aux demandes grandissantes en termes de consommation et de production. Nous nourrissons l'espoir de voir cette discussion aboutir à des propositions concrètes qui aideront les pays à développer et à mettre en œuvre des politiques publiques qui tiennent véritablement compte de l'urgence d'adresser une question aussi brûlante pour l'avenir de la planète et de l'humanité tout entière. Je me réjouis déjà que des thèmes cruciaux comme l'environnement, la pauvreté, la pollution sous toutes ses formes et par les déchets plastiques en particulier, la protection du milieu marin, la protection des écosystèmes et de la biodiversité, l'intégration des questions de genre, la participation des femmes dans les politiques et des programmes, entre autres, soit l'objet de préoccupations et a été adressé au cours de cette discussion. Au niveau national, nous sommes en train de prendre des dispositions pour adresser ces questions que nous considérons comme cruciales pour un développement national durable. À titre d'exemple, mon gouvernement s'associe à la société civile pour mettre en œuvre un programme d'énergie propre qui a déjà touché plusieurs communes de mon pays. Dans le cadre de cette initiative, dont les femmes font partie prenante, nous nous attelons à installer des pompes solaires de grande capacité d'alimentation en eau pour l'irrigation des petits, pé pé petits périmètres irrigués. Enfin, nous travaillons à la promotion de solutions innovantes pour la gestion des résidus solides incluant la promotion d'une initiative zéro plastique visant à parvenir à terme à une gestion des résidus solides et l'interdiction de l'utilisation des matières en plastique et de styrofoam en Haïti. Monsieur le Président, si importantes que peuvent être ces initiatives, entre toutes les nations. En ce sens, nous saluons la tenue de cette Assemblée et qui nous permet d'adresser ces problèmes tout en formulant le vœu de voir aboutir des solutions et des décisions courageuses qui soient à la hauteur des problèmes auxquels nous sommes confrontés. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Excellency, Mr. Joseph Chauté. I now invite His Excellency Mr. Shiranbat Namshwai, Minister of Environment and Tourism, Mongolia. Minister, you have the floor. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Mongol government Mongolia, its people, I would like to express appreciation to the government of Kenya for the great hospitality, United Nations environment for the preparation and arrangement for this assembly, and a special thank to the President of UNIA for taking leadership on this very important theme on sustainable innovation and mainstreaming sustainable consumption and production. Mongolia is proudly presenting to you all here some of the progress and achievement we have gained in period of third and fourth session of UNIA. Aligned with the, its national strategies and pledged commitment towards global environmental benefits, the partial ban on single-use plastic bag is enforced by 1st of March. Ban on alcohol consumption at urban, mainly at the capital city where half of population live, would be effective of this way. As preparation towards better implementation, the government engages with private sectors, researchers, academias, as well as civil societies to promote innovative and alternative solutions that can be applicable nationwide. The Green Passport Campaign. The campaign is organized and still on active engagement with youth and children at nationwide, based on the voluntary and action-oriented approach. Through this campaign, Mongolia is aiming to build a strong and active 
young generation to pro-environment and green and sustain sustainable development while recognizing the role of youth and children is very crucial at all stages of any actions. Increase of the state protected areas as indicated in national sustainable development vision, which has a strong reference of the 2030 development agenda and the Paris Agreement. Mongolia believes that systematic and life cycle approach should be the leverage point for the decision making, planning and implementation process. Hudrum Mongolia acknowledged the uh, technology achievement and innovative solutions to tackle the challenges as well as encouraging the progress of actions and congratulates to the member states for your strong commitment on the resolution to be agreed soon. Understanding the importance and significant contribution of infrastructure to the development of each and every country, of course to the benefit of people, Mongolia has submitted the draft solution, resolution on sustainable infrastructure. According to the existing studies and prediction, there will be more infrastructures to be developed, which requires magnificent investment as well. Having this resolution agreed by this assembly sure would contribute to the countries to mainstream nature and environment within its development. Then we all would benefit to the implementation of the SDGs and Paris Agreement. The government of Mongolia reassures its commitment to, the, to implement the resolutions and decisions adopted here at this UNIA and to support initiatives, campaigns to aim to bring the healthier environment to the country and the planet. Thank you very much. I thank His Excellency for your statement. May I now invite His Excellency Mr. Paul Oquist of Nicaragua to deliver his statement. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Muchas gracias, Señor Presidente. Presidente Daniel Ortega Saavedra, Vice President Rosario Murillo Zambrana, El Gobierno de Reconciliación y Unidad Nacional, Y el pueblo de Nicaragua extendemos nuestras profundas condolencias y solidaridad a los seres queridos de las víctimas de la tragedia aérea del domingo pasado. La pregunta más cadente en el siglo XXI es si nuestra civilización va a poder sobrevivir el cambio climático en curso y las armas nucleares existentes. La historia nos enseña que El cambio climático puede acabar con civilizaciones. La historia nos enseña que las primeras civilizaciones con gobiernos centrales, Acadia en Mesopotamia y el antiguo reino en Egipto, entraron en crisis desde hace 4,200 años por sequías que afectaron a sus sociedades y llevaron al derrumbe de sus estados debido a la de una era de hielo, el inicio de una edad de hielo. Como nuestro cambio climático es antropogénico, podemos actuar sobre las causas en vez de solo adaptarnos a las consecuencias. El informe IPCC sobre 1.5 grados nos enseña que para lograr la meta de reducir emisiones en un 40% para 2030, y alcanzar una sociedad sostenible de cero emisiones para 2050. También nos enseña de que la diferencia entre 1.5 y 2 grados es exponencial, como demuestra que a 2 grados hay la extinción de los corales y la aceleración del deshielo del, del uh, permagel ártico, librando gas metano 20 veces más potentes y dañinos que el CO2. Hoy se debate si las políticas públicas deben basarse en ciencia o avaricia, siendo avaricia todavía predominante, apoyado por dos alienaciones subjetivas que identifico en mi libro, Equilibra. Primera, la creencia en que puede haber aumento sin fin, sin límite y sin sentido 
en producción, consumo, acumulación y concentración del capital en un planeta con recursos finitos, o sea, el capitalismo salvaje. Segunda, la, cre la creencia de que no importa el daño que hacemos a los ecosistemas que sostienen la vida en el planeta Tierra, porque la ciencia y la tecnología siempre nos salvarán, o sea, un cientificismo mesiánico. Lograr la sociedad sostenible de cero emisiones implica que necesitamos hacer profundas transformaciones en defensa de la vida frente a la inmortalidad suprema de causar extinciones. Lo que necesitamos es un movimiento mundial para la supervivencia. En siglos recientes, las grandes transformaciones sociales victoriosas de la moralidad sobre intereses hegemónicos poderosos han sido el resultado de millones de personas en diferentes sectores y países con diferentes métodos, métodos luchando para un claro objetivo común, abolir la esclavitud, independencia del colonialismo, derechos laborales, sufragio para la mujer, derechos civiles. Se requiere ahora la, un movimiento para la supervivencia. Se requiere la presión social para forjar la voluntad política necesaria para realizar las grandes transformaciones. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. I thank His Excellency, Mr. Paul O'Quist, for his statement. I now invite His Excellency, Mr. Lamin B. Dibba of Gambia, Minister of Environment, Climate Change, and Natural Resources, to deliver his statement. Mr. Minister, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> Mr. President, honorable ministers, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, the Republic of the Gambia cherishes the national ecological resource base of the environment, which is essentially the basis for livelihood across the country. Overall, the country the country's rich biodiversity is at risk of depletion due to habitat destruction, urbanization, agricultural expansion, and wood utilization. Furthermore, the Gambia is faced with challenges on waste collection and management. <clears throat> In addition, Mr. President, the Gambia, like many other developing countries, is bearing the, the, the burden of climate change impact with associated environmental and socioeconomic losses. The phenomena continue to drive environmental and natural resource degradation, such as decline in annual average rainfall and high consumption rates of our forest resources. At national level, Mr. President, the Gambia has put, in, has put the preservation and protection of the environment at the highest level. We have developed national policies, programs, and projects, legislations that are geared towards protection of the environment for the present and future generations. Such policies include the Gambia Environment Action Plan 20, 2010 to 2018, National Climate Change Policy 2016, Strategic Environment Assessment Policy 2017, and recently, the Forest Act 2018. Some of the concrete steps taken by the government of the Gambia to address certain environmental challenges include, among others, on climate change impact, the Gambia has developed a strategic program on climate resilience with the support of the World Bank through the African Development Bank to provide the country with an overarching climate policy, climate friendly investment framework. We have also taxed ourselves through our nationally determined contribution to the Paris Agreement to drastically reduce greenhouse gas emission from sectors from key sectors of the economy. We plan a 44.4% reduction by 2025 and 45.4% reduction by 2030 with domestic and international support. Mr. President, to achieve this ambitious goal, we have collaborated with our sub-regional partners within the framework of the organization of the Gambia River Basin, the OMVG, to provide member countries with cleaner energy hydropower. The Gambia is also currently implementing an EU project, EU-funded project, to electrify over 1,000 schools, and over 100 health facilities across the country using solar power. With the implementation of these two projects, Mr. President, this will reduce our dependence on fossil fuel by more than half, 
which invariably reducing for deforestation mainly in the areas in the rural area. Waste management, Mr. President, the Gambia is faced with several challenges on waste and, impl and, and the implications of unattended waste uh, of the country. In 2017, we in enacted an anti-littering regulation which is meant to limit indiscriminate littering in the country. This was followed by the ban on single-use plastic order of 2015, which prohibits the importation of plastic, sale, manufacture, and use of plastic bags in the country. This has generated positive results in reducing the amount of waste generated in the country, thus leading to the use of reusable bags and recycled materials, as well as phasing out single plastic use. As a result, the First Lady of the Gambia, High Excellency, Madam Fatma Barbaro, has been selected at the last African Union Heads of States and Government meeting in Addis Ababa to champion the clean... Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency, Mr. Debo, Minister Debo. I now invite His Excellency, Mr. Eric Gregorian, Minister of Nature Protection, Armenia, to make his statement. Thank you. Distinguished Chair, Your Excellencies, Ministers and Delegates, on behalf of government and people of Armenia, I would like to express our deepest condolences to the families that have lost their loved ones on Ethiopian Airlines Boeing flight. The Republic of Armenia highly values the opportunity to share our views with member states, civil society, private sector and other stakeholders for bringing the environmental issues to an international level of attention. Recognizing that unsustainable consumption and production practices have a significant impact on economies, environment and the people. The environmental issues are correlated with the quality of human life, economic and social situation. It is important to admit that poverty is one of the main environmental problems and poverty reduction can have a significant impact with solving environmental problems. We believe that environmental activities are not extra cost anymore, but economically efficient and socially fair long-term investment for our present and future. The government of the Republic of Armenia emphasized the importance of the integration of economic and environmental policies, and we believe that the best economic decisions are definitely made once the environmental components are taken into consideration. Moreover, the environmental activities are more efficient when they are harmonized with economic and social factors. One of the successful examples of our implementation path is the world's first national SDG Innovation Lab, that is a joint initiative of the government of Armenia and the United Nations. The lab was set up in 2017 to draw upon innovative methodologies from across the world to support and accelerate the SDG implementation. I would also like to highlight that Armenia has joined to the GEF7 Global Electric Mobility Program and in this respect, the government has passed a decision according to which the import of electromobile will be waived from VAT. The government of the Republic of Armenia initiated the process of the gradual pass out of single-use plastics and the relevant legislative package is currently under development. Armenia will intensify its private sector participation in environmental actions since the business engagement is key to developing and performing um, detailed country-specific environmental plans and programs. Ladies and gentlemen, Armenia has also taken important steps to address the climate change, considering that Armenia was ranked fourth among the most climate-vulnerable countries in the region. We are closely cooperating with the global funds. In particular, we are implementing Green Climate Fund project, which is the tenth financed by GCF globally and the first one in the Eurasian region. Over the past year, the Republic of Armenia has developed a unique and innovative climate finance mechanism. This mechanism is a combination of concept uh, debt for nature and uh, commitments undertaken in the framework of the Paris Agreement. 
We believe this mechanism can be successfully scaled and we would be happy to share our experience and knowledge in developing and utilizing it. Thank you. I thank His Excellency for his statement. And may I now invite His Excellency Abdullahi Amud Mohammed of Somalia to deliver his statement. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Excellencies, colleagues, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. Let me first of all register our appreciation to UNEP for the excellent arrangement in organizing and preparing for this conference. We also thank the government of Kenya for the warm hospitality accorded to my delegation. Environmental resources of Somalia, like elsewhere in the world, form the foundation and the basis of the socio-economic development of the country. The country has very rich and diverse biomass and ecosystems that have for generations supported the livelihoods of the population. As a predominantly agro-pastoral society, the health and well-being of the population depends on the health of the ecosystems. Over the past 30 years or so, however, due to the long period of conflict, the natural resources base has become a major victim. The breakdown of governance and management systems have led to devastation and degradation of the natural resources due to the uncontrolled over-exploitation driven from externally as well as internally. Forests and rangelands have been plundered. The oceanic resources have been overexploited, and tons of illegal toxic waste have been dumped along our shorelines. These destructive practices have not just led to further improv imp impoverishment of the populations, but unfortunately have become a source of insecurity. The illegal actions perpetrated mostly by external actors contribute to the fueling and prolonging of the conflict. The illegal export of charcoal by criminal cartels have been confirmed to be a source of illegal funds to the extremist groups, while the illegal, unregulated, and unreported fisheries of our coastline fuels criminalities that remain the source of insecurity in Somalia, as well as neighboring countries. We continue to voice our concerns above, about these destructive activities at global forums like UNEA, and we urge and call for concerted global action. Needless to say, we are all interconnected and the dumping and destructions in Somalia have far wider reach and implications beyond the poison sites in our country. We are happy that the UN Security Council, UNEP, and other UN agencies have recently prioritized the issue of illegal charcoal exports, and we thank the development partners who have come to support these initiatives. We wish to call for more commitment and support from the destination countries for this illegal charcoal. A lot more needs to be done if we are to achieve the goal of leaving no one behind. As we struggle with the destruction of natural resources as elsewhere, the impacts of climate change remains a matter of life and death for Somalia. Climate change and associated desertification and land degradation impacts the country's growth and recovery potentials. The, fre the frequent droughts in the Horn of Africa region have almost become a permanent feature affecting food, water and energy security internal displacements and migrations of climate refugees due to the ravaging effects of climate change is a common phenomenon today. Without enhanced commitment to support adaptation efforts to the attainment of the sustainable development goals will become that much more distant and, distant and difficult. We urge for the greater cooperation and support in tackling the menace of climate change and desertification. Somalia is willing and welcomes all partners to join us towards achieving poverty eradication and environmentally sustainability. I thank you all. I thank His Excellency Abdullahi Hamoud Mohammed for his statement. And I now invite His Excellency Mr. Joang Molapo of Lesotho to make his statement. Excellency, you have the floor.
Mr. President, Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we bring greetings from His Majesty King Lithia III, the government and the people of the Kingdom of Lesotho. The Basuti Nation wishes to extend its deepest and most sincere sympathies and condolences to all those affected by the tragedy of the Ethiopian Airlines crash. Let me first of all extend my thanks to the government of the Republic of Kenya for the wonderful hospitality given to me and my delegation in this august assembly. This forum provides an opportunity for all of us gathered here in Nairobi in our assortment of differing responsibilities, needs, and contributions to deliberate and recommit ourselves to the requisite and urgent actions needed to address the myriad of environmental challenges that continue to challenge us in all corners of this planet that we have as our only home. Let me also congratulate the presidency of this fourth UN Environment Assembly and his team for the commendable efforts made to build consensus on the common goals that we must share if we are to realize collectively the results that we all aspire to. Mr. President, Lesotho supports wholeheartedly the sentiments expressed by the Africa Group. In this statement, we seek to underscore the following when addressing the theme of this assembly, which is innovative solutions to environmental challenges and the sustainable consumption and production. The innovative solutions and in initiatives we adopt must seek to reestablish the proper balance between all spheres of the environment. It is short-sighted and impossible for Lesotho to think that because it is landlocked and hundreds of kilometers from the ocean, that marine issues do not affect us. We live high in the mountains of Southern Africa in our, unique, in our own unique alpine environment, but the issues and challenges of the rainforests of those or those of clean air a continent away impact us. The interconnectivity and interdependence of our planetary ecosystems should be a continuous and ongoing lesson to us as governments about the need for genuine cooperation and mutual respect. May I humbly offer that the urgency and priority of required actions will differ for each continent, region, or country and the appropriate response will depend on the conditions associated with a particular situation. The actions proposed must contribute not only to addressing the local issues, but must also contribute to the overall success of regional and global goals. Notwithstanding the intrinsic interconnectedness and interdependence of all aspects of the environment, we have to manage and continue to focus on sustainability. We talk on this continent about Agenda 2063 and the Africa we want. There are other important Pan-African framework programs, other global programs under the various multilateral environmental agreements. We as a nation subscribe fully to the objectives and work steadfastly towards the targets of the Sustainable Development Goals. All of these are woven together by the overarching objective of achieving a sustainable future. For us in Lesotho, proper land management remains a critical challenge to our long-term sustainability. The elevation of Lesotho ranges between 1,500 and 4,000 meters above sea level. It is a country with the highest low point in the world. Over 63% of the land base is mountainous. It is truly the kingdom in the sky. It is also sometimes referred to as the water tower of Southern Africa. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you for your statement. I now invite His Excellency, Mr. Al Mustafa Gaba, Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development, Niger. Merci, Monsieur le Président, Monsieur le Président de l'Assemblée. Monsieur le représentant du gouvernement kenyan, Mesdames et Messieurs les ministres et chefs de délégation, Mesdames et Messieurs distingués délégués, je voudrais tout d'abord adresser les sincères condoléances du gouvernement et du peuple de mon pays à toutes les familles endeuillées par le tragique accident d'avion de Chopin Airlines survenu le 10 mars dernier. Je voudrais également remercier le gouvernement et le peuple kenyan 
pour l'hospitalité et l'accueil chaleureux dont ma délégation et moi-même avons fait l'objet depuis notre arrivée à Nairobi. Je félicite enfin l'ONU Environnement et son personnel pour la bonne organisation de cette quatrième session de l'Assemblée de la, de, des Nations Unies pour l'Environnement. Mesdames et Messieurs, chers délégués, le Niger a engagé des réformes politiques, stratégiques et institutionnelles en lien avec le thème de la présente Assemblée qui sont transposées dans tous les secteurs de développement économique et social du pays et dans tous les plans de développement communaux de plus de 300 collectivités territoriales. Et ces réformes sont traduites en projets et programmes en conformité avec la politique nationale d'environnement et de développement durable dont les grandes lignes portent sur la mise à niveau des entreprises sur l'efficacité des ressources et la production propre, la promotion de consommation de production durable et la création d'emplois verts, la mise en œuvre du programme de restauration des paysages forestiers et la gestion durable des terres, ainsi que la mise à l'échelle de plusieurs techniques et bonnes pratiques éprouvées en la matière, la promotion d'une agriculture intelligente face au climat et la résilience de l'exploitation du pâturage et du cheptel. La gestion concertée transfrontalière des habitats de faune sauvage et de lutte contre la criminalité des espèces de faune et de flore protégées, le contrôle des importations et de consommation de produits chimiques et dangereux dans les activités économiques ainsi que dans l'agriculture, la traduction de notre CDN en programme d'adaptation dans les domaines de l'agriculture, de l'élevage et du reboisement, pourvoyeur d'emplois, surtout en milieu rural. Les projets de construction de centrales solaires et d'autres formes d'énergie renouvelable dans les villes et l'électrification rurale par le solaire, le solaire photovoltaïque, et j'en passe. De même, il me plaît de rappeler et de saisir cette opportunité que nous venons de sortir les 25 et 26 février dernier d'une rencontre au sommet suivi d'une table ronde des partenaires techniques et financiers pour le financement d'un ambitieux plan d'investissement climatique élaboré pour la commission climat de la région du Sahel, présidée par le Niger. D'importantes ressources financières ont été annoncées par les partenaires pour le financement de la première génération de projets structurants de ce plan afin de catalyser les investissements climatiques dans les 18 pays de l'espace du Sahel. Ces projets permettront de renforcer la résilience au changement climatique de 10 millions de ménages, dont 30% dirigés par des femmes, de séquestrer 120 millions de tonnes d'équivalent carbone sur 5 ans et de créer 200 000 emplois pour les jeunes et les femmes. C'est le lieu de remercier une fois de plus tous les partenaires pour leur engagement et de réitérer par la même occasion l'engagement de nos États à relever les défis pour mobiliser ces ressources annoncées afin de rendre concrets tous les projets structurants pour la période 2020-2025 pour le bien des générations présentes et futures. Je vous remercie de votre aimable attention. I thank His Excellency Al Mustafa Gaba for his statement. And I now invite His Excellency Dr. Mr. Mehmet Emin Bapina, Turkey to deliver his statement. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank uh, to the UN Environment for their excellent work in organizing UNEA4 and the government of Kenya for their hospitality. I would like to express my deepest condolences to the United Nations and its member states for sad accident that took place three days ago. Honorable delegates, as an innovative solution for the waste management, Turkey initiated the Zero Waste Project in 2017. This project continues under the auspices of our First Lady, Her Excellency Madam Emine Erdogan. With the dissemination of this project nationwide, the recovery rate will increase by at least 35%, providing additional employment to 100,000 people and approximately 4, million, 4 billion US dollars contribution to the Turkish economy by 2023. Also, an amendment to the environmental law was enacted in 2018 
which introduced fee for plastic bags, recycling share fund, and compulsory deposit implementation. Furthermore, we are going to organize the first ministerial conference on zero waste on November 1st and the 2nd in Istanbul this year. So I would kindly invite all of you to this remarkable conference. Please mark your calendars. Honorable delegates, zero waste approach contributes to our marine protection activities as well. We ex extend significant efforts towards protecting our marine environment, which we call blue homeland. According, according to the recent reports, if current trend continues, there should be more plastic than fish in the sea by 2050. Unfortunately, existing programs and measures are not sufficient to efficiently reduce the marine litter and microplastics. That's why we strongly urge the UN to formulate a new solution-oriented and sound international agreement on this issue. I would like to state that Turkey is ready to provide the utmost support for such an initiative. Ladies and gentlemen, during my capacity as a president of the Bureau of the Barcelona Convention, a memorandum of understanding on marine litter was signed between Barcelona and Bucharest Conventions. This outstanding cooperation shows Barcelona Convention is a pioneer role and it should be set a good example for the rest. I believe COP21 in Italy would present a good opportunity for the further elaboration on marine litter and microplastics. Last but not least, we are aware of uh, that ensuring the sound management of the chemicals promotes innovative solutions for the environmental challenges we are struggling against. And we support the regional and global efforts related to, to chemicals. Furthermore, Turkey is among at approving policy instruments and supporting mechanisms for sustainable consumption and production. In this regard, we will develop a national action plan and I would like to underline our determination to take part in relevant UN activities. So I believe that we should act together. Uh, in this context, I wish success to this August gathering. Thank you. I thank His Excellency Dr. Mehmet Emin Bapina for his statement. And may I now invite His Excellency Mr. Vivani Shilenga, Deputy Minister of Natural Resources, Energy and Mining of Malawi, to make his statement. You have the floor, Excellency. The Honourable, the Honourable President of UNEA, distinguished delegates, dear colleagues, all protocols observed. First and foremost, the government of Malawi wishes to join the international community in offering deepest sympathies to the families and loved ones of those who lost their lives in Sunday's tragedy. Our thoughts have been with them for the duration of this assembly. Mr. President, regarding UNEA event, I would like to express our gratitude to the United Nations Environment Program and the Government of Kenya for the excellent organization and warm hospitality accorded to us this week, especially at such a difficult time. Further, we wish to congratulate Madam Inga Anderson on her new appointment as UNEP Executive Director and wish her the best. Mr. President, Malawi would like to align itself with the statement delivered on behalf of the African group by my Ethiopian brother, Minister of Environment, Forestry and Climate Change, Professor Fekadu Beyene Aleka. Malawi is blessed with rich biodiversity, which is essential for our very survival and without a healthy ecosystem, the economic growth, poverty reduction, food security, and disaster resilience will not be possible. We therefore recognize the urgent need to keep the ecosystems healthy 
through sustainable land management and ecosystem restoration. Mr. President, this aspiration cannot be achieved in isolation if there is no collaboration among governments, multilateral institutions, the private sector, and non-state actors in our activities. Engagement across all sectors of society is critical to bring about the lasting social and behavior change. With the policy framework that has been built to achieve sustainable growth, a progressive approach is required harnessing new thinking, science, and technology. Distinguished delegates, Malawi wishes to renew its call to the executive director of UNEP to expedite implementation of all the previous UNEA and governing council decisions and resolutions in a balanced manner, especially those of priority to Africans in as much as renew our edge to UNEP to develop at the earliest opportunity in consultation with the member states a monitoring mechanism by which we can track and access the status of implementation of our previous and future resolutions. Finally, Mr. President, Malawi is fully committed to supporting and promoting implementation of all resolutions made by UNEA4, and we pledge to demonstrate and implement the decisions in full. I thank you for your kind attention. I thank His Excellency, Mr. Shilenga, for his statement. And may I now invite His Excellency, Mr. Ian Shimpianu of Romania to make his statement. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. President, Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor and pleasure to have the opportunity to address you today at the world's highest level decision-making body on the environment, United Nations Environmental Assembly here in Nairobi. We are saddened by the tragic circumstances that affect this meeting. We express our deepest condolences for those who lost their lives in last Sunday's tragic event. Their absence increase, increases our responsibility to make this meeting a success. In the spirit of the outcome document of the Rio Plus 20 conference entitled The Future We Want and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, we come together to the fourth session of the United Nations Environmental Assembly, UNEA4, under the slogan, Innovative Solutions for Environmental Challenges and Sustainable Consumption and Production, to strengthen our political commitment for shifting the global economic system towards more sustainable directions and to catalyze intergovernmental actions necessary for us to live sustainably. We have made enormous progress. Billions of people have been lifted out of poverty. At the same time, the economic growth has been fueled by a huge demand for resources, and our economical models of consumption and production have had devastating impacts on our planet. According to a report by the International Resource Panel, the global resource use grew eightfold between 1990 and 2000, from 6 billion to 49 billion tons. And humanity could consume by 2050 an estimated 140 billion tons of minerals, ores, fossil fuels, and biomass per year, three times its current appetite. The change we need to do means innovation and creativity. To achieve sustainable development, <clears throat> we have to adopt sustainable consumption and production patterns and to shift to a low carbon and resource efficiently economy in order to decouple economic growth from the over exploitation of natural resources. Also, we recognize the need to find solutions, especially in relation to the pollution issues covered by the Sustainable Development Goals, such as air pollution, 
soil pollution, water pollution, management of chemicals and wastes, the growing use of fertilizers in order to reduce adverse effects on human health, natural life support systems. We welcome the very constructive consultation and discussion in a very positive way that took place during last week and this week, and we are certain that UNEA 4 will be a success, reaching agreement on many resolutions in our efforts to build a better future. We appreciate the draft ministerial declaration and we support the UNEA president, Minister Sim Kiesler from Estonia, in his efforts to preserve a level of ambition that meets the urgent need to address specific areas. We consider that UNEA 4 succeeds in identifying innovative solutions for national governments, the private sector and civil society, with a view of tackling environmental challenges that have an impact on society, economy and the environment. We fully believe that UNEA 4 should be innovative, open to all citizens of the world and action-oriented in the spirit of its essence, with the result proposed being particularly important along with the approval of the ministerial declaration. Further believes that a significant role in our action will have to ensure transparency involving of all major groups, private sector, civil society, NGOs, academia, parliaments and governments. Without ensuring a sustainable consumption and production, the circular economy and as the I thank His Excellency, Mr. Ian Sempiano, for his statement. And may I now invite His Excellency Ahmad Mohammed A. Al Sadal on the Secretary of Municipality and Environment of Qatar to deliver his statement. Your Excellency, you have the floor. It's not working. That's okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. As-Sayyid al-Rais, Ashab al-Ma'ali wa Sa'ada, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته في البداية أود أن أقترم هذه الفرصة ليعرف عن تعازينا الخالصة لضحايا حادث سقوط الطائرة الأثيوبية التي تحطمت وهي في طريقها إلى نيروبي سائلا المولى أن يرزق أهليهم وذويهم الصبر والسلوان كما نشكر جمهورية كينيا على حسن الاستقبال والضيافة السيد الرئيس أن تواجدنا اليوم جميعا في هذه الدورة يعد دليلا دامغا على اقتناعنا كمجتمع دولي بضرورة التنسيق والتعاون والعمل سويا من أجل المحافظة على البيئة عن طريق إيجاد الحلول والابتكارات المناسبة لمواجهة التحديات التي تؤثر سلبا على التقدم في هذا المجال السيدات والسادة أود أن أركز هنا على ضرورة بذل الجهود اللازمة لضمان الاستدامة البيئية مما يكفل المنفعة للأجيال الحالية والأجيال القادمة وذلك على جميع الأصعدة الوطنية والإقليمية والعالمية عبر وضع وتنفيذ الاستراتيجيات والمبادرات والخطط العمل والبرامج لتحقيق خطط التنمية المستدامة 2030 وملاءمتها مع الظروف الوطنية لكل دولة وبالشكل الذي يحقق مبدأ المسؤولية المشتركة في سبيل الحفاظ على بيئتنا والدفع بعالمنا نحو مستقبل أفضل ومستدام السيدات والسادة لا يفوتني هنا أن أثني وأشيد في هذا الصدد بهذه الدورة التي تساهم دائما في إتاحة الفرصة للمباحثات والمشاورات بين الدول لوضع استراتيجيات وأسس لتنظيم عملية التطوير المستمرة في المجالات المختلفة المعنية بالحفاظ على البيئة بالإضافة إلى مساعدة جميع الدول وخصوصا الدول النامية لتعزيز تقدمها في هذه المجالات الحضور الكرام إننا في دولة قطر وإدراكا منا بأهمية المساهمة على الصعيد العالمي في مواجهة التحديات البيئية وجعلنا حماية مواردها وترميتها من أهم استراتيجياتنا التنموية وذلك بالإضافة إلى وضع الخطط وتنفيذ العديد 
من البرامج الخاصة بالاستدامة البيئية التي تدعم مسار التنمية في نفس الوقت وإن النتيجة الرئيسية هي الحفاظ على البيئة للأجيال القادمة من خلال توفير بيئة أقل تلوثاً وأقل تأثيراً بالتأثيرات بالمناخ وبيئة تحافظ على التنوع البيولوجي بما يضمن حياة صحية للبشر والنظم الطبيعية والتنمية المستدامة إضافة إلى ترسيخ ممارسات الاستدامة البيئية في الدولة ختاماً أكرر شكري وتقديري للمنظمين والقائمين على هذا الحدث المتميز ومتمنين الجميع التوفيق مع الأمل بالخروج بنتائج مثمرة شكرا السيد الرئيس I thank His Excellency Mr. Ahmad Mohamed E. al for his statement. I now invite His Excellency Mr. Musa Sima, Deputy Minister for Union Affairs and Environment, Tanzania. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, Honorable Ministers, Excellence, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to convey uh, Greetings from His Excellence Dr. John Pombe Joseph Magufuli, the President of the Government of the United Republic of Tanzania. And congratulate you, Mr. President, and your Bureau for proceeding over this important session. I also wish to extend my sincere gratitude to the Government of Kenya for gracious hosting the fourth session of UNEA. Also, I wish to extend condolences to the victims of the Ethiopian air crash. Mr. President, majority of the population in Tanzania depend a lot on natural resources. Inadequate management of natural resources has contributed to various environmental challenges facing the country, which include climate change, land degradation, environmental pollution, and deforestation. While the unsustainable pattern of consumption and production, including efficient use of resources, contributed significance to these challenges and threatening the process of achieving sustainable development. The theme of this session, innovative solution for environmental challenges and sustainable consumption and production, should remind us to reflect on the need to enhance integrating sustainable consumption and production in two relevant policy, plan, program, and project at all level. Mr. President, in Tanzania, the National Environmental Policy of 1997 and the Environmental Management Act of 2004 have specific provisions promoting sustainable consumption and production in the country. On one hand, there are other environmental policies uh, advocates for, the, for putting in place resources, saving and waste recycling facilities, using of clear technology and production of safe and less toxic products. While on the other hand, the Environmental Management Act provides for, for the cleaner production technologies and techniques as well as sustainable consumption of goods and services. Furthermore, the government has taken on board sustainable consumption and production concepts as it is strives to become middle-income country by 2025. The government is emphasized on establishing the efficient industries at all scales and ensuring clear resource of power for these industries. Mr. President, innovation it is a broad scope. It is increasingly perceived and crucial for tackling environmental challenges and addressing existing sustainable consumption and production pattern. Therefore, there is a growing need to increase support to develop countries, to developing countries, including United Republic of Tanzania, to enhance effort to implement policies, strategies, and a program promoting innovative solutions. In this regard, this session offers the variable platform to promote and share experience and solution of our ambitions toward sustainable development. It is time for innovative environmental thinking toward achieving the sustainable development goal. Let us play our part. Santeni sana. I thank His Excellency Mr. Musa Sima for his statement. May I now invite His Excellency Mr. Arturs Storms Pless, 
Parliamentary Secretary of the Ministry of Environmental Protection and Regional Development for Latvia. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Latvia aligns itself with a statement of the European Union and its member states. UNEA 4 aims to foster the use of innovative solutions for environmental challenges and transition to sustainable consumption and production. Therefore, the consequential outcome of UNEA 4 should be reflected in strong ministerial declaration and concise resolutions. In the light of UNEA 4 discussions on existing solutions for reverse negative impacts on natural environment, I would like to highlight some tools used in Latvia that could encourage other countries to follow. In Latvia, we have established legal basis for green public procurement with specific environmental criteria for public procurement of goods and services such as food, cleaning products, lightning and more. Similarly, we promote the application of green public procurement in construction sector where investments will have a long-lasting impact. In addition to legal requirements, we are also working on awareness raising and capacity building. For example, we have developed product life cycle cost assessment calculator and organized annual training of procurement specialists. Furthermore, Considerable work is taking place in order to facilitate and accelerate the transition to circular economy. Our practices contribute to doing more with less by increasing net welfare gains from economic activities while reducing resource use and degradation of ecosystems. Latvia has further strengthened one of the core economic instruments serving for environmental purposes the natural resource tax, by regularly reviewing both the tax rates and tax base in order to target the polluting activities and enhance resource efficiency. Expected co-benefits include reduced pressure on environment, a more efficient use of resources, and changing consumer behavior. Innovative solutions should also support the promotion of startups, business development, innovation, and technology transfer, as well as cooperation between research and business. In Latvia, we are also actively exploring a wide range of innovative solutions. For example, a wider use of digital services and interconnectivity between information systems allows environmental authorities to track waste streams within the country and gives citizens access to information regarding the nearest waste separation points. Last but not least, I would like to emphasize the essential role of early and effective involvement of all stakeholders in order to facilitate accountability and inclusiveness. Empowering citizens and civil society groups is a valuable way to achieve sustainable consumption and production patterns and move towards circularity. Enabling a circular economy translates to many cross-cutting solutions for sustainable development goals. Therefore, transition to circular economy should be our priority. Thank you. I thank His Excellency, Mr. Arthur Storms-Bless, for his statement. May I now invite His Excellency, Ambassador Martin Gomez Bostalo of Argentina to make his statement. Ambassador, you have the floor. Gracias, señor presidente. En primer lugar, queremos señalar nuestras más sinceras condolencias a las familias de las víctimas del trágico accidente aéreo y a los gobiernos que han perdido con nacionales. Señor presidente, distinguidos miembros y delegados, excelencias, señoras y señores. La delegación argentina participa de esta cuarta asamblea con el mismo compromiso y convicción asumidos desde la primera asamblea, reconociendo que estas instancias de diálogo contribuyen a definir el futuro de nuestro planeta y por lo tanto el porvenir de la vida de las generaciones presentes y futuras. En este marco, resulta precedente destacar que concebimos a la Agenda Ambiental y de Desarrollo Sostenible como un componente fundamental de la Agenda de Derechos Humanos. En virtud de los efectos 
de la naturaleza en nuestras sociedades, es necesario que se tomen medidas para crear infraestructura y proteger fundamentalmente a las poblaciones más vulnerables, dado que cuando se degrada el ambiente, lo primero que se degrada es lo humano y los que menos tienen pierden todo. Por lo tanto, es una obligación de los Estados y, en este sentido, se debe orientar la cooperación internacional. Durante estos días nos proponemos una vez más reflexionar sobre nuestra casa común, tomando en consideración los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible y asumiendo el desafío de constituirlos en el tablero de control de la gestión de nuestros gobiernos. Señor Presidente, el lema de esta Asamblea nos obliga a reflexionar sobre los niveles de producción y consumo alcanzados por nuestras sociedades modernas y preguntarnos si van de la mano con un planeta saludable. Es necesario avanzar hacia un cambio cultural para que la rentabilidad de cualquier actividad económica vaya de la mano de la sostenibilidad. Nada debe ser rentable si no es sostenible, pasando del actual, del actual modelo lineal a uno circular, incluyendo en el término no solo la economía, sino también la gobernanza. El haber ejercido la presidencia del G20 en el 2018 nos brindó la oportunidad de poner en alto nivel de discusión un componente clave del concepto de consumo y producción, la eficiencia en el uso de los recursos. Por ello, dimos continuidad e impulso al diálogo sobre eficiencia de recursos del G20. Durante la presidencia argentina del Foro de Ministros de América Latina y el Caribe, ejercida durante el año pasado, propusimos a la región la incorporación de compromisos adicionales voluntarios de países y grupos de países, logrando avances incrementales que hoy se evidencian, por ejemplo, en el proyecto de resolución en materia de movilidad sostenible que, junto con Costa Rica, Chile y Perú, proponemos adoptar en esta distinguida asamblea. El transporte urbano sostenible es prioritario. En Argentina, el sector... I thank Ambassador. I thank Ambassador Martin Gomez Bastillo for his statement. I mean, I now invite Dr. Ms. Cheryl Case, Head of Delegation, United Kingdom, to deliver her statement. Dr. Chase, you have, Dr. Case, you have the floor. Thank you. Mr. President, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, I would like to join others in sharing the condolences of the UK to everyone affected by the tragic plane crash at the weekend. The loss of friends and colleagues who were traveling to be with us at the meeting is a great sorrow, and they will be sorely missed. I am speaking on behalf of my minister who has been unable to travel to Nairobi. The world is facing unprecedented global environmental challenges, tackling climate change, biodiversity loss, and the unsustainable use of natural resources will require transformational changes as well as innovative solutions. The UK government is committed to leave the environment in a better state than we found it. Our 25-year environment plan published in 2018 by the Prime Minister is already being put into action. In December, we launched the Resource and Waste Strategy for England. It sets out how we will preserve natural materials, material resources by minimizing waste, promoting resource efficiency, and moving towards a circular economy. On plastics, the UK will take additional measures beyond those already underway. We are consulting on a tax for plastic packaging with less than 30% recycled content, and we have established a plastic pact partnership between government and industry. And we support the Global Plastics Action Partnership led by the World Economic Forum. On climate change, the UN Secretary General's Climate Summit in September is a crucial moment to accelerate action, and the UK is leading on climate resilience at the summit. 
we hope that you will stand with us in committing to actions that will transition us to a climate resilient planet. The UK is also committed to playing our part to develop and deliver an amb ambitious post-2020 global biodiversity framework. This will be adopted at the 15th Conference of the Parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity in 2020. We will develop our ambition on biodiversity with a holistic and integrated approach with climate change. This is essential to successfully address the complexity of drivers and their impacts on nature. A strong understanding of the economics of biodiversity is essential for us to make better policy decisions and to communicate the economic and environmental rationale for actions on biodiversity to all those that need to take them. Today, the UK has announced a major new global review of the economics of biodiversity, led by Professor Sir Pater Dasgupta. Transformational change is necessary for governments and all stakeholders, including industry and the private sector and together we must develop and implement plans of action. We thank UNEP for providing the platform to bring us together and for their work in these areas. And we look forward to working with all parties to, to deliver positive global change. Thank you. I thank uh, Dr. Case for her statement. And before I invite the next speaker, just to remind all presenters that we wish to stick within the three minute time frame with some flexibility. I have absolutely no control over the mind of the timekeeper and uh, we are hoping to get through as efficiently as possible and I wish to thank those of you who have participated so far. May I now invite his Excellency Ambassador Noah Galgendler, Head of Delegation, Israel, to deliver his statement. Ambassador, you have the floor. The President, distinguished delegates, SCP, Sustainable Consumption and Production, is an area in which everyone is part of the problem and of the solution. There is almost always something we can change to act more sustainably. But it is up to governments to provide the framework for this. Governments must promote policy and technological innovation to break the link between growth and increased resource use. I would like to demonstrate this with an example. The annual demand for fresh water in Israel is almost double the availability of natural fresh water and is expected to increase as the population grows. So, are, so how are we able to bridge this gap? With the right combination of innovative solutions. On the demand side, a blend of regulatory information, technological and economic tools led to large water saving in consumption. Most of Israeli irrigation crops use drip irrigation, which saves up to 70% of water. On the supply side, we implemented cutting-edge technological solutions. Israeli consumers get water from the largest and most cost-effective reverse osmosis plants in the world using local technology. At the same time, 86% of wastewater is reused, by far the highest rate in the world supplying over 50% of agricultural irrigation water and freeing fresh water for domestic use. Stringent quality standards enable unrestricted irrigation. But Israel has been promoting SCP in an array of air areas, not only water. The 2017 plastic bag law led to nearly 80% reduction in plastic bag use and to a much cleaner coastal and marine environment. Despite a very small fee, three US dollar cents for plastic bags, small steps can have a significant environmental impact. A SCP National Action Plan for Israel for the years 2015-2020 was prepared as part of the UN, EU funded 
switch med program implemented by UNIDO and UN Environment and involving all sectors. The roadmap addresses issues such as best practices for SMEs and government companies, green investment, green public procurement, environmental labeling, and prevention of greenwash. We are now planning to update the SCP National Action Plan beyond 2020. In addition, as part of transforming the way our, economics, our economies work, Israel is preparing a long-term strategy for a low-carbon economy in 2050. Israel is also currently establishing an environmental efficiency knowledge center, which will act as a hub and provide tailor-made consulting services to improve the environmental performance of industry. To boost environmental innovation, policymakers should demonstrate regulatory tolerance and take into account the risk of temporary and controlled deviation from areas attributed to best available technique. The Israeli Ministry of Environmental Protection, in cooperation with the Israeli Innovation Authority, seeks to empower the Israeli clean tech sector. This will help, Im help improve. I thank His Excellency, <laughs> Ambassador Noel Galgenro, for his statement. May I now invite Ms. Camila Zepada Lizama, Head of Delegation Mexico, to deliver her statement. You have the floor. Buenas tardes, representantes de naciones hermanas y actores no gubernamentales aquí presentes. Reciban un cordial saludo del licenciado Andrés Manuel López Obrador, presidente de México. México tiene en su más alta prioridad la erradicación de la pobreza y la eliminación de las brechas de desigualdad. Como activos contribuyentes al proceso de definición de la Agenda 2030, celebramos el nuevo paradigma del desarrollo sostenible que reconoce la interdependencia entre justicia social, protección del capital natural y un crecimiento económico incluyente. Sin embargo, a más de tres años de su adopción, también entendemos los retos que conlleva implementar una Agenda de Desarrollo Integral. Por ello, estamos trabajando en la construcción de nuestro nuevo Plan Nacional de Desarrollo considerando a la Agenda 2030 como una hoja de ruta. Es un esfuerzo transversal que, en coordinación con diversos sectores, representa una oportunidad clave para consolidar un modelo de crecimiento que garantice el bienestar social por medio del uso sostenible de los recursos naturales. Estamos convencidos de que es posible atender prioritariamente a los más vulnerables y, al mismo tiempo, aumentar la competitividad económica con la adopción de esquemas productivos que permitan la conservación del patrimonio natural y con el diseño inteligente de espacios urbanos. Ese es precisamente el llamado de esta Asamblea, transitar hacia patrones de producción y consumo más sostenibles. Creemos que no solo es posible, sino incluso más eficiente y rentable, apostar por modelos de desarrollo que hagan un uso racional de los recursos, distribuyan mejor los beneficios de su aprovechamiento y apuntalen procesos de economía circular. México ha dado los primeros pasos en este sentido, con la adopción de una estrategia nacional y un programa especial de producción y consumo sostenible para adoptar prácticas que permitan hacer más y mejor con menos. Sostenemos la importancia de mantener una lógica integral en la atención de los grandes problemas ambientales que nos aquejan, de carácter complejo, multicausal y transfronterizo. Para ello, se requieren soluciones innovadoras que los gobiernos no pueden impulsar por sí solos. Si bien como autoridades nos compete establecer las condiciones y alinear los incentivos para fomentar prácticas sostenibles, es indispensable el compromiso del conjunto de la sociedad. Es por ello que esta Asamblea debe seguirse fortaleciendo y consolidando como un espacio de coordinación y búsqueda de sinergias. México seguirá abogando porque la Asamblea se constituya como el espacio de discusión y posicionamiento sobre la dimensión ambiental de la Agenda 2030 a fin de informar los trabajos del Foro Político de Alto Nivel para el Desarrollo Sostenible. Instamos a que los acuerdos alcanzados durante esta cuarta sesión se traduzcan en acciones concretas de implementación que beneficien a quienes tradicionalmente se han quedado atrás en los procesos de desarrollo y garanticen la sostenibilidad de los bienes públicos globales para las próximas generaciones. Ante la Comunidad de Naciones, México reafirma su compromiso para hacer de esta aspiración una realidad. Gracias.
I thank uh, Ms. Camila Zapata Lizama for her statement. May I now invite Ms. Rosemary Patterson, Head of Delegation New Zealand, to deliver a statement. You have the floor. Mr. President, distinguished ministers and colleagues, executive director and your staff, before I start, let me express deep condolences to all those who have lost loved ones in Sunday's tragic accident. Mr. President, the state of the global environment remains perilous. While much good work has been done since we last gathered here, many challenges remain. This Environment Assembly is an opportunity to galvanise further action on issues that go to the heart of environmental stewardship, including sustainable resource management, environmental data and engaging with civil society. My delegation welcomes the President of the Environment Assembly's determination to drive progress on these issues and I assure him of New Zealand's full support. More is required to foster sustainable consumption and production. The global economy needs to move away from a linear take, make, dispose economy to a circular economy. And we need to do more to tackle climate change. New Zealand will do its bit. This year we will adopt a target of a net zero carbon emissions economy by 2050 with legally binding emissions reduction targets. We will stimulate new private sector investment through a $100 million fund. In other areas where we are increasing pest control efforts to better protect our native forests and wildlife. We are focused on improving the quality of our waterways and additional waste minimization initiatives. From July, supermarkets and retailers will be required to stop supplying single-use plastic bags. This builds on our existing ban on plastic microbeads. We will continue our ambitious plan to plant one billion trees. This year we will present our first well-being budget. It introduces new ways of setting targets and tracking progress based on what enables New Zealanders to live fulfilling lives. The health of our environment is a fundamental part of this process. Mr. President, we all need to improve international cooperation to foster sustainable consumption and production. One area where more work is needed is environmentally harmful subsidies. It beggars belief that $425 billion are spent every year subsidizing fossil fuels. This is to say nothing of other harmful subsidies, such as those fueling overfishing. This needs to end. We all need to work together to set ambitious biodiversity targets in the Convention on Biological Diversity. This work should be complemented by an effective treaty addressing biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. Internationally, New Zealand will continue to champion the needs of small island developing states, including in the Pacific. Uniquely vulnerable to climate change, the Pacific also faces challenges such as invasive alien species, marine plastics and waste disposal. More support is required. We have recognised that need and are stepping up our support and engagement. When it comes to UNEP, New Zealand welcomes continued efforts to ensure that it is efficient, effective and accountable. UNEP has strong expertise in many areas. It should focus its efforts on these areas. Duplication should be avoided. Resources should be spent where they will have the most impact. Mr. President, ministers, officials, activists, environment champions, everyone. Our environment is our responsibility. We must all step up to protect it. Thank you. I thank you, Ms. Rosemary Patterson. And may I now invite His Excellency Dr. Hadi Farajvand from the Islamic Republic of Iran to deliver his statement. You have the floor. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, the Compassionate, the Merciful, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, I wish to express my sincere gratitude to the government and people of the Republic of Kenya for hosting environment family. I also would like to express my condolences to the family of those who lost their beloved in recent planned crash. 
Mr. President, in our region, we are facing with several environmental, environmental emerging issues and problems which are even exacerbated. Water resources, scarcity, long-standing drought, sand and dust storms, plastic and e-waste are among those environmental challenges that require collective measures and the innovative solutions. Shift from pure profit and selfish material gain in the national as well as global development policies to solely social and environmental oriented programs and policies is a fundamental prerequisite to overcome these challenges. These measures and policies shall technically be based on fair criteria, equity, and CBDR, taking into account the needs and capabilities of parties and in accordance to the obligations and commitments in various international environmental instruments. I must emphasize that uh, water scarcity has a serious socioeconomic implications which along with climate change resulted in extreme events such as droughts, floods, hurricanes, and sand and dust storms that put a large population of world's, uh, a large portion of popula world's population at a great risk. Mr. President, unilateral sanctions imposed on the people and the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran will result in impediment and serious damages in our energy efficiency plans, combating climate change and, mutual, and natural resources management. As a result, several major wetlands are in critical condition since we can no longer offer required ecosystem services. Although we endeavor to manage these issues, but undoubtedly we have challenges in addressing them without transfer of technology, capacity building, resource mobilization, and regional and global cooperation. The Islamic Republic of Iran offers to establish a regional center for early warning and monitoring system, which the joint collaboration of the international institution and the countries in the region to further strengthen its adaptation activities are at a regional scale to issue such a drought, dust storm, and dust haze phenomenon. We appreciate and support United Nations environmental activities regarding establishment of international co coalition uh, on combating sand and dust storm with collaboration and cooperation by all United Nations entities. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, once again, I un underline the Islamic Republic of Iran's support to the United Nations lead efforts to combat environmental challenges. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank His Excellency, Dr. Hari Farajvand, for his statement. May I now invite Dr. Mr. Kangayat Karazu of Malaysia to deliver a statement. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. On the onset, let me join others to thank the government of Kenya for their warm hospitality and UNEP for the excellent facilitation and documentation preparation for UNIA4. While I have the floor, we, we too would like to express our deepest condolences to the government of Ethiopia and families who have lost their loved ones in Ethiopian airline flight ET302 crash. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, to address the theme of Unia 4, Malaysia has recognized sustainable consumption and production, or shortly known as SCP, as an important approach to promote economic growth without compromising the environment nor jeopardizing the needs of future generations. SCP has been underscored in our recent development plans the 11th Malaysia Plan, 2016 to 2020, under its green growth strategy, had outlined SCP as a vehicle to reduce environmental degradation, enhance sustainability, while improving the standard of living, quality of life, and societal well-being in line with SDG goals. 
Malaysia is also currently developing a national SCP blueprint, and the government had already embarked on green procurement programs where all federal agencies and ministries have been required to implement this program since 2017. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to speak on the urgency for member states to pay attention on marine debris and plastic pollution. Malaysia is committed to combat plastic pollution, has recently unveiled Malaysia's roadmap to a zero single-use plastic 2018-2030. Besides marine debris, Malaysia is extremely concerned over plastic waste and rubbish entering our country from other parts of the world, many with false declarations. We want this to stop, and it must stop at source country, especially we urge our developed country colleagues to help us in this. Realizing the magnitude of this transboundary problem, we are joining many others in the need to explore an international governance framework to address this issue, including the amendments to the Basel Convention. Excellency, while we were at Union 4, we heard echoes and concerns by many, the need and the urgency to address this issue. But the concerns were not translated by urgency to work, nor to move forward effectively. This is reflected in the weak resolution on this issue, which we adopted a while ago. But Excellency, in the spirit of working with others and moving forward, Malaysia will continue to work with all parties and stakeholders to address this serious environmental threat in years to come. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Malaysia is a mega diverse country with 55.3% of our land still under forest cover. Hence, we are very concerned by some resolutions which are used through this UNIA platform, which is not based on science and are discriminatory in nature. The case in point is the proposed draft resolution on deforestation and agriculture commodity supply chain. We are very concerned about this draft resolution and we like to just say that we all gathered in this August assembly to move the global ag environment agenda forward together in the spirit of common but differentiated responsibility and respective capabilities. Let's not derail this momentum by discriminatory resolution proposals. In this regard too, I would like to emphasize Malaysia's commitment to the work of UNIA. However, we would like to stress for UNIA in coming years to keep the agenda I thank His Excellency, Dr. Kangarak Kaburazu, for his statement. I now invite His Excellency, Ambassador Mr. Winston Luckin of Suriname to deliver his statement. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observes. Um, joining those who have expressed their feelings of sympathy for the friends and families who have lost their loved ones at a terrible accident, and also our appreciation to the UN environment and the government of Kenya for organizing this special event. I'm standing here today on behalf of Suriname, the most forested country in the world with more than 93% forest coverage, and speaking also on behalf of the HFLD countries. I can do this because um, last month at the HFLD conference and the mandate that was adopted by the HFLD countries to make sure that in the Paramaribo Joint Declaration, the issue of the HFLD countries is there. Um, we have one key message that we want to send out here today, and that is that the HFLD countries, during, at a result of the contribution that they have been given to the fight against climate change, even before the existence of the climate change conventions, wants to see their recognition fully supported. Um, there are some very important instruments that have been drafted addressing the importance of forest, water, biodiversity, uh, um, job creation and, and ecosystems, all issues directly connected to sustainable production and consumptions. And when we see, for example, what has been drafted in the CDB, uh, um, the 
preamble of the Paris Conventions, the UNFF, um, we see that these are instruments that mention especially the importance of, of forests and to find the right balance between development and environment. 24% of the forests of the world is located in the HFLD countries. But if we see what the reality is, is that most of the international finance goes to countries where forests are being uh, disappearing or already lost, and 14% of the financial resources only is going to the HFLD countries. Sometimes we feel that we are being punished for behaving well. All these conditions have to be put in place if we want to make sure that SCP happens how we intend to do it. One cannot expect from us to meet the conditions within our social sustainable development goals or the Paris Agreement we will be in full force next year without the, the important financial support, the technical assistance, transfers of technology, capacity building to make sure that sustainable production and consumption is well taken care of. Um, we call upon the United Nations system, especially the UNFF and the UN environment, to be part of the process that we have been started in Suriname and join us and support us with the outcome of the conference of the Paramaribo um, Declaration. Um, Mr. Chair, when we look at um, what is happening today, we once again want to call upon the United Nations system to support the HFLD group in the process that we have started to make sure that this important role of the forest, the biodiversity system, water, food supply, job creation is well taken care of. The environment is not only our life, it is our survival. Thank you, Chair. I thank His Excellency Ambassador Mr. Winston Luckin for his statement. May I now invite Dr. Melchior Mataki, Head of Delegation Solomon Islands, to deliver his statement. Ambassador, you have the floor. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Recent uh, global environmental assessments concluded that the quality of environment is deteriorating and the window of opportunity to halt and reverse this negative trend is rapidly closing. Our draft State of Environment report revealed that 17 of the 27 indicators are deteriorating as well. Environmental degradation is clear on areas that are hosting or have hosted economic activities such as logging and mining. A case in point is the current grounding of a bulk bauxite carrier, which has spilled more than 80 tons of heavy fuel oil into the marine environment and causing an environmental disaster. Nevertheless, I'm also pleased to report that the Solomon Islands is undertaking some innovative approaches within our context in line with sustainable development and our national development strategy. At the policy level, a gradual shift is taking place from sector-based policy development to issue-based policy development. We have a national waste management and pollution control strategy that integrates the management of all types of waste. A national ocean policy was recently passed to strengthen integrated ocean governance and action at all levels and across sectors. Efforts are also underway to align climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. Public-private partnership for environmental sustainability is an emerging trend of implementation. This includes the strengthening of recycling and waste management through the establishment of an association of private sector operators that are dealing with uh, recycling and waste management with the support from the government and also the partnership between the government and the Solomon Islands Rangers Association to support biodiversity conservation. Training of economic initiatives with environmental protection is also gaining momentum in the country. Private citizens and environmental NGOs 
initiated this transition. The government has built on this with its partners and are scaling up this approach through national projects such as the, such as the Tina River Hydropower Project and the Pacific Ecosystem Based Adaptation to Climate Change Project. The government recently approved the Sky Islands Initiative and pledged to protect and conserve 21% of our total land area that is situated 400 meters above sea level. This initiative, among others, will accrue biodiversity and ecosystem benefits, as well as sustainable financial benefits to landowners and contribute to meeting our IG biodiversity targets. Mr. President, circular economy is critical to decoupling environmental degradation from economic development. But to us, it will be meaningless in the context of waste that arise from imported goods such as electronic equipment, chemicals, and most of all, plastics. Mr. President, in our context, national efforts alone are inadequate without global support for capacity building, appropriate technology transfer, and financial resources to prevent pollution, keep warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius, and hold biodiversity loss. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. I thank His Excellency Dr. Melchior Mataki for his statement. May I now invite His Excellency Mr. Abdel Karim Haga, Minister of Environment, Chad. Minister, you have the floor. Monsieur le Président, Mesdames et Messieurs les chefs de délégation, Mesdames et Messieurs, en vous rendant grade et qualité tout protocole distingué, distingué délégué, c'est pour moi un honneur et un réel plaisir de prendre la parole ces jours au nom du peuple tchadien, de son gouvernement et de son président de la République, chef de l'État, son Excellence Idriss Déby Itno, dans le cadre de la quatrième session de l'Assemblée des Nations Unies pour l'Environnement, dont le thème suffisamment évocateur porte sur des, des solutions novatrices pour relever les défis environnementaux et instaurer des modes de consommation et de production durables. Avant tout propos, qu'il me soit permis au nom de la délégation tchadienne d'adresser à son Excellence Uru Kenyatta, président de la République du Kenya, à son gouvernement et au peuple frère du Kenya, mes félicitations pour avoir abrité les présentes assises et mes sincères remerciements pour toutes les facilités, tout autant, tout autant que les marques d'attention dont nous sommes l'objet depuis notre arrivée à Nairobi. Je voudrais surtout, au nom du gouvernement de la République du Tchad, que j'ai l'insigne honneur de représenter, adresser mes félicitations au secrétaire général des Nations Unies, au, secrétaire, au secrétariat du programme des Nations Unies pour l'environnement, pour l'organisation réussie de cet événement planétaire. Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs distingués délégués, le Tchad, mon pays situé au cœur de l'Afrique, couvrant une superficie de 1 284 000 km carrés, faut-il le rappeler, est subsaharien, enclavé, dépourvu de toute façade maritime et désertique sur près de deux tiers de son territoire. Cette situation géographique exceptionnelle l'expose aux différents aléas climatiques et fait de celui-ci un pays vulnérable aux effets pervers des changements climatiques. À titre d'exemple, le lac Tchad est passé d'une superficie de 25 000 km² en 1960 à 2500 km² pendant la grande sécheresse de 1984, réduction de superficie qui est imputable à 50% au changement climatique, selon une étude du Punier de 2011. Cette diminution réduit considérablement les productions agricoles, notamment halieutiques. Aux facteurs climatiques s'ajoutent des facteurs anthropiques tels que les pollutions de toutes sortes qui impactent notre atmosphère, nos ressources en eau, les sols et la biodiversité. Conscient de la vulnérabilité particulière de ces écosystèmes et de ces communautés, notamment les femmes, les enfants et par leur intermédiaire les générations futures, le gouvernement de la République du Tchad n'a ménagé aucun effort pour assurer à un certain nombre d'engagements, tant nationaux qu'internationaux, en matière de protection de l'environnement. C'est ainsi qu'au niveau international, notre pays est partie prenante à plusieurs accords multilatéraux relatifs à l'environnement, notamment la Convention 4 des Nations Unies sur le changement climatique et son protocole d'accord de Kyoto, l'accord de Paris, les conventions de Rotterdam, de Bâle, de Stockholm et de Bamako, pour ne citer que cela. Au plan national, 
sous la prévoyante direction de son Excellence Idriss Déby Itno, président de la République, chef de l'État, soucieux de garantir la santé de sa population et la protection de son environnement, le CAD a érigé en principe constitutionnel le droit à un environnement sain et l'obligation d'une protection de celui-ci, tant collectivement qu'individuellement. La vision 2030, le cadre que nous voulons, qui est le continent, qui est le document national d'orientation par excellence, ainsi que le plan national de développement PND 2017-2021, qui en découle en parfaite cohérence avec les objectifs du développement durable, consacre également une large place aux questions liées à la protection de l'environnement et au bien-être des populations, ainsi qu'au développement durable. Dans cette même lancée, un vaste programme de réformes juridiques et institutionnelles visant à doter notre pays d'instruments et d'outils efficaces de gouvernance environnementale et d'action climatique est engagé. I thank His Excellency, Mr. Abdel Karim Haga, for his statement. May I now invite Mr. Abdurrahman Zona Saidomram, Head of Delegation, Tajikistan, to deliver his statement. You have the floor. Уважаеми председатели, уважаеми делегати и участники дани мероприятия, Прежде всего, позвольте поблагодарить за предоставленную возможность выступить в работе 4-го Ассамблеи ООН по окружающей среде и выразить признательность за ее организаторам, Организации Объединенных Наций и правительству Кении за создание хороших условий работы. Подобные встречи дают возможность обменяться мнениями о путях реализации принципов устойчивого развития в странах и регионе в целом под делиться опытом для решения существующих экологических проблем. Климатические условия и горный рельеф Таджикистана создали благоприятные возможности для формирования уникальных горных экосистем, значительных запасов пресной воды и гидроэнергетических ресурсов. Общий объем выбросов парниковых газов в Таджикистане составляет всего 2,3% от базового года, что является наименьшим показателем в странах Центральной Азии. Это объясняется тем, что 98% электроэнергии в Таджикистане производится гидроэлектростанциями. При условии освоения потенциала гидроэнергоресурсов Таджикистан реально мог бы сделать существенный вклад в озеленение секторов экономики стран Центральной Азии, тем самым значительно способствуя снижению выбросов парниковых газов в регионе и уменьшению потребления углеродного топлива. Одним из уникальных проектов в этом плане является проект КАСА-1000 линия электропередач, который предоставит возможность передачи более 1000 мегаватт экологически чистой электроэнергии из Таджикистана и Киргизстана в Афганистан и Пакистан. Согласно Парижскому соглашению, предварительные обязательства Таджикистана предполагают ограничение выбросов парниковых газов к 2030 году объемом соответствующим 80-90% от уровня 90-го года – за счет собственных средств в стране и 65-70% этого уровня при условии существенной международной поддержки. Правительством страны принимаются конкретные меры по проведению исследований в поисках решений и смягчении негативных последствий изменения климата и реализации адаптационных мер. Планирование в условиях высокого риска требует больших инвестиций, которыми Таджистан в силу финансовой и экономической возможности не располагает. Между тем, эти риски имеют региональный характер и в этой связи необходимо усиление деятельности международных институтов по развитию сотрудничества в регионе в области устойчивого развития, эффективного использования природных ресурсов, в том числе совершенствования механизмов управления водными ресурсами с учетом проблем сохранения экосистем, связанных с водой, таянием ледников, повышением температуры и растущим дефицитом водных ресурсов. Хотел бы обратить ваше внимание на новую глобальную инициативу Таджикистана об объявлении международного десятилетия действий воды для устойчивого развития 2018-2028 годы, по которым Генеральная Ассамблея ООН приняла соответствующую резолюцию. Данная декада начиналась в марте 2018 года и представляет уникальную возможность объединить наши усилия в достижениях целей устойчивого развития, связанных с водой, социально-экономических и природоохранных целей. 
Водна иницијатива позволи да се стави соответствиш програми и пројекти, а такви расшири сатуриство и пареотство на всех уровнија. Уверен меѓународни соопштества должен во образом во спозуваја премуствами и возможностите декади за решение водни и природоохранни вопроси и достижени цели устојчива развитие. Спасибо за внимание. Thank you, Mr. Saidamman, for your statement. May I now invite His Excellency Mr. Siddiqui. Can we have some assistance with the light? I don't know if we will wait. Thank you. May we proceed? I now invite His Excellency Mr. Siddiqui, Head of Delegation Afghanistan, to deliver his statement. You have the floor. Thank you. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Mr. President, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ministers, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let me share my government and delegation's deepest sympathy and condolences with the victims of the plane crash happened on Sunday, 10th of March. On behalf of the government of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, I would like to begin by expressing my appreciation to the government of the Republic of Kenya for hosting and the UN environment for organizing the fourth session of the Environment Assembly in this nice city of Nairobi. Distinguished delegates, as we are all aware that extreme rates of environmental degradation currently being observed have ominous social, cultural, and economic consequences for the human population. Pollutions, climate change, waste, and chemical having disastrous impacts on the health of humans and other species around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, to illustrate this point, allow me to share our own experience. Afghanistan is suffering from a severe drought across the country since 2018 that has led to severe f food insecurity for millions, loss of millions of livestock, forest resources, biodiversity, ecosystem services, and melting of snow and glaciers. Furthermore, pressures such as poverty, land degradation, drought, desertification, water scarcity, and air pollution are compounded by almost four decades of conflict. Therefore, my government is still committed towards environmental governance and protection through the implementation of national regulations, multilateral environmental agreements, sustainable development goals, and other agendas to overcome the challenges as we have. And we have also taken appropriate actions to cover also resolutions of UNIA 3 as well, such as Establishment of the Supreme Council of Water, Land, and Environment, which is presided over by His Excellency the President. National Climate Change Committee and Strategy, enacting regulations, laws, and policies. And implementation of projects on land degradation, forestry, uh, biodiversity, uh, chemicals, and others through GEF Adaptation Fund, GCF, and government funds. So, there is still need for further technical assistance and financial support as a least developed country to enhance actions and capacities. Distinguished delegates, we do not believe that all hope should be abandoned. We have the technology and expertise now, and we understand how adoption of a circular economy can reduce the impact of pollution without compromising the achievement of our sustainable development goals. Once again, let me repeat myself. This is predicted upon joint action by a global partnership at all levels, from global down to locals. Honorable delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude. We all 
we, we thank all delegations for showing their commitments and contribution to the development of decisions that will put us on a, uh, on a path to sustainable and environmentally secure future. On behalf of the people of Afghanistan, I would like to reiterate our fundamental belief that the achievement of our goals requires collective actions across the world in tackling these challenges without consideration of gender, ethnicity, politics, or other distractions. Thank you. I thank His Excellency Mr. Siddiqui for his statement. May I now invite Mr. John Chun-sik, Head of Delegation, Democratic People's Republic of Korea. You have the floor. Mr. President, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, on behalf of the Delegation of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, I express my confidence that this assembly will be a due success under able leadership. At the same time, my delegation joins the others in expressing condolences and sympathies to the victims of the Ethiopian air crash. Mr. President, the government of the DPR Korea has put great efforts on the environmental protection in order to provide people with equitable economic conditions as well as more civilized and clean environment, enable them to enjoy independent and creative life true to the nature of the people-centered socialist system. Comrade Kim Jong-un, chairman of the State Affairs Commission of the DPRK, declared the National Forest Restoration Campaign as a war to protect the nature, assuming himself the responsibility of the commander-in-chief to lead all out the national campaign. More than 1.6 million hectares of the forest will be recovered by 2024. We are now developing both national environment protection strategy and national energy strategy aimed at harmonizing environmental protection and economic development, thus turning the national economy into sustainable, circular, and eco-friendly pattern. Mr. President, the environmental protection is a global issue that all member states should tackle together. We are all on the same boat. My delegation would like to stress that the global environment issue should be taken by all as moral and ethical duties. Those countries neglecting current alarming environmental challenges and legally binding international agreements for their selfish interest should come to conscious and join the global efforts. I'd like to also emphasize that the cooperation related to the environment should not in any case fall victim of the politicization. Some developing countries are deprived of funding for implementation of the environmental related programs. It is a frustrating sincere efforts of those countries. Due to the sanctions pursued by hostile forces, projects in my country have been suspended or even disapproved. The international environment organizations and funds such as UNF, GF, UNCCD should not be influenced by such politicization tendency, but to provide all countries with equitable support. In conclusion, Mr. President, my delegation reaffirms that the DPRK government will actively join in the international efforts to protect global environment. Thank you. I thank Mr. Zhang chon sik for his statement. And I now invite Mr. Joshua Wycliffe, Head of Delegation Fiji, to make his statement. You have the floor. President of the fourth session of the UNAIR, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Fiji extends its heartfelt condolences to the families and friends of all those dear colleagues who lost their lives en route to the assembly here. May the Almighty bestow them with his divine comfort at this hour of deep sorrow. The government of Fiji thanks the acting executive director of the UN Environment Program and the executive committee for extending this invitation to the Fijian government 
It is a great privilege to be here on behalf of Fiji's Minister for Waterways and Environment and deliver Fiji's national statement. Fiji welcomes the areas of focus and the theme set for the fourth UN Environment Assembly. The areas of focus and the themes directly speak into the very issues that affect our nation's economic viability, its sustainable development aspirations, health, culture, and the Fijian way of life. Fiji is an archipelago state of more than 300 islands. Like the other Pacific Island countries, Fiji is a large ocean state, and the challenges that tackle the environmental programs are the same as most island nations face today. Fiji is conscious of the integral role played by the natural environment in its progress trajectory that the nation has adopted, not just in the short term, but also in the long term, impacting economic progress, cultural needs, and the welfare of its future generations. Fiji's economic base depends on tourism, fishing, and the agricultural sectors. These se sectors are heavily reliant on an environment that is relatively free of waste and pollution. Fiji seeks to protect these vital business segments through innovating partnership models and avenues with the private sector. Fiji anticipates these efforts would result in a win-win solution to the environment, the communities, and the businesses as well. Well, a lot of efforts are being put in the national level, Fiji, like the rest of the Pacific, is at the receiving end of the transboundary marine plastic pollution that we see today. This situation arises mostly from the careless behavioral patterns displayed globally from quarters domiciled several time zones away. Marine plastic pollution in all its forms threatens the ecological integrity of Fiji's oceans, which has sustained Fijians for several years. If this threat is not combated immediately on a global scale, then the future of all Fijians and the wider humanity as a whole remains bleak. The existing global and regional programs, platforms, framework covering marine litter and plastic pollution seem to be fragmented and insufficient. They do not provide the means and tools necessary for an effective global response to their problem. In addition, this issue cannot be resolved on a national or a non-binding voluntary measure that can be put in place. It requires a coordinated global action through shared responsibility under a common and consistent platform. Fiji calls for a legally binding global instrument with tangible targets that includes monitoring and reporting mechanisms. This instrument would go a long way in combating the marine litter and pollution issue and offer a global response towards this issue, which is transboundary in nature. Mr. President, I thank you. I thank Mr. Joshua Wycliffe for his statement. And may I now invite Ms. Martha Rojas Orego, Secretary General of Ramsar Convention, to deliver her statement. You have the floor. Thank you. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to make this statement on behalf of the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands at this crucial meeting in Nairobi as the international community gathers to identify and implement innovative solutions for sustainable consumption and production. We all agree that our world is increasingly polluted, rapidly warming, and quickly losing its biodiversity. And we all know that we need to address our current consumption and production patterns. Many solutions to these challenges are found in nature and more specifically in wetlands. Wetlands or water-related ecosystems such as aquifers, lakes, rivers, peatlands and swamps, and along the coasts, mangroves, seagrass meadows, and coral reefs provide us with services and solutions that are critical to achieve sustainable consumption and production. I would like to start by highlighting one, water. We depend on wetlands for the water we use for consumption energy and agriculture, with agriculture using 70% of the existing fresh water. Wetlands are also a source of food and sustain our livelihoods. Wetlands serve as valuable natural infrastructure for agriculture, providing reliable water and fertile soils. But they are at risk from agriculture's growing demands for land and water. 
Today, roughly 2.5 billion rural people depend directly on agriculture on wetlands. The functions and economic values of wetlands must be considered in planning for the production of food and other agricultural products in order to respond to the growing food demand. With the fast growth of our global population, especially in cities, wetlands take an even greater significance. When conserved and sustainably used, wetlands function as filters, absorbing pesticides and chemicals and removing harmful waste from water and thus contribute to improving water quality. During storms, wetlands absorb excess rainfall, which reduces flooding and prevents disasters and their subsequent costs. Last year, the Ramsar Convention introduced the Wetland City Accreditation and recognized 18 pioneer cities that have taken ex exceptional steps to safeguard the urban wetlands and make urbanization more sustainable, thus contributing to more sustainable consumption and production patterns. We need to urgently step up the protection, sustainable use and restoration of wetlands as an essential element in policies and action to respond to various environmental challenges and to create the future we want. The Ramsar Convention on Wetlands is a ready-made platform for this, bringing together 170 countries, many of them present here, and providing the global framework for the conservation and sustainable use of all wetlands. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Ms. Mara rojas for your statement. May I now invite Mr. Benjamin Shasta, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, to deliver his statement. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. It is my pleasure to deliver this statement on behalf of the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. OHCHR welcomes the endorsement at UNEA 4 of a resolution to promote gender equality and the human rights and empowerment of women and girls in environmental governance, and congratulates Costa Rica for its successful stewardship of this initiative. This resolution, like the Human Rights Res Council resolution on the environment, emphasizes that environmental damage can have direct and indirect impacts on the effective enjoyment of all human rights, especially for persons already in vulnerable situations. Under international human rights law, states have an obligation, acting both individually and jointly, to prevent these negative impacts. But today, environmental degradation poses both an imminent threat and an already realized harm to the effective enjoyment of human rights. Seven million people die each year from air pollution alone. Climate and weather-related disasters intensified by climate change displace people by the millions. Our bodies, our health, and our children's health are at risk from environmental threats, known and unknown, of our own making. Ensuring sustainable consumption and production will be critical to prevent these threats from worsening. Presently, 26 billionaires own as much wealth as the poorest 3.8 million people. In some communities, people starve, while in others, food goes to waste. Human rights, including the right to food, will not be fulfilled simply by increasing production. The International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights specifically calls upon states to cooperate to ensure an equitable distribution of world food supplies in relation to need. To ensure sustainable consumption and production, we must act, as also called for in the United Nations Declaration on the Right to Development, to more equitably distribute the benefits of development. There are legal, behavioral, and policy solutions that can help us achieve this imperative and address the challenges we face. Empowering all people, including women and girls, to make decisions about their own lives is critical. The right of all peoples to freely dispose of their wealth and natural resources must also be protected. Yesterday, OHCHR, along with Sweden, Costa Rica, UN Environment, and the UNDP UN Environment Poverty Environment Initiative, organized a side event on the human rights based approaches to innovation for sustainable development. The messages which emerged were clear. There will be no sustainable development without human rights for all. 
Environmental human rights defenders must be protected. Indigenous people's traditional knowledge respected. The rule of law maintained. States and businesses held to account for their actions and participation, access to information, justice, and effective remedy ensured. In closing, I wish to highlight that human rights law underpins the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and has important implications for all of the SDGs, including SDG 13 on sustainable consumption and production. SDG 12 targets emphasize, among other things, the need for environmental education, access to information, and the sharing of the benefits of science and its applications. All human rights. It is these and other human rights considerations that we urge you to account for in your, decision here at the in your decisions here at the United Nations Environment Assembly and in the actions you take at home to carry them out. Thank you for your consideration. I thank Mr. Shasta for his uh, presentation. And may I now take the opportunity to invite Ms. Barbara Tavora Janechill, United Nations Forum and Forest, to deliver her statement. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure for the Secretariat of the United Nations Forum and Forest, UNFF, part of the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, UNDESA, to be present in the fourth session of the United Nations Environment Assembly. I would like to acknowledge the statement just delivered by His Excellency Ambassador Winston Lakin from Suriname and let him know that high forest cover, low deforestation countries can always count on the UNFF Secretariat and UNDESA support. Mr. President, the, UNF, the UNFF Secretariat very much values the existing close cooperation with UN Environment. As a fellow member of the Collaborative Partnership on Forests, we work very closely with this program on all issues related to forests. Moreover, as the focal point of UN DESA for the subject of illegal harvest and trade of wildlife and forest products, the UNFF Secretariat constantly interacts with UNEP which currently presides the UN Interagency Task Force dedicated to this theme. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, the assembly, this assembly's theme, innovative solutions for environmental challenges and sustainable consumption and production, couldn't be more appropriate. It is time for business as unusual, and there are many challenges to face, but challenges come with opportunities, and as document UNEP slash EA.4 slash 17 demonstrates, there are plenty of creative and innovative options to build a world which produces and consumes, and consumes in a more sustainable manner. To that end, we need inclusive joint efforts involving all stakeholders, and those efforts are bound to succeed. I would like to mention an inspiring example. Carbon footprint from wood-based textile fibers can be significantly lower than synthetic ones. Moreover, the enhanced production of wood-based textile fibers has the potential to improve the livelihood of numerous forest communities. Last year, during the 2018 session of the High Level Political Forum, UN DESA co-hosted a side event on the UN Partnership for Sustainable Fashion and the SDGs. On that occasion, 10 different UN entities agreed to establish a UN Alliance on Sustainable Fashion, which is being formally launched during UNAIR 4. The important role played by several parties, including various UN entities, such as the UN Economic Commission for Europe, Fashion Entrepreneurs and Civil Society, should be recognized. Yes, we need business as unusual, and this partnership among those various stakeholders is an excellent example of how, bold, how a bold approach can promote positive change. In closing, I would like to remind you that the 14th session of the United Nations Foreign Affairs will take place in New York from 6 to 10 May 2019. We look, for, we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much. I thank Ms. Barbara Tavoa Jainchel for her statement. And now I 
invite the uh, two who are um, to make a joint presentation. Lily Jebkowi, Tanvi, and Paul Koffel Beborn. They are representing the youth. You have the floor. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, we wish to send our deepest condolences and prayers to the family and friends of all the 152 people who lost their lives in the Ethiopian airline AT302 bound for Nairobi, among whom we were fellow, our fellow youth from U UNA Canada. We shall ensure to raise our voices louder in their honor and memory. We acknowledge and applaud the efforts of the member states towards creating innovative solutions for environmental challenges. We urge you not only believe in young people as part of the solution to create positive change in the world, but to also take deliberate action to invest in increasing the participation of children and youth in the long-term design of the UN environment. This year's theme, Innovation for Sustainable Consumption and Production, which means a new idea and method. I wonder, where is the new generation? We seem too few, yet we are the group that is affected by all the decisions being taken at this union. We are also the group co contributing most to the innovative solutions. Don't leave us behind. Don't trash our future with plastics or burning fossil fuels. With the worsening climate and environmental destruction, the goal of going to school begins to be pointless. Why study for a future which may not be there? Why spend a lot of effort to become educated when our governments are not listening to the educated? Our distinguished delegates, we youth and children are the few who have access to have our voices heard. And even then, it's a battle. Systems are not clear, frameworks and policies not implemented. Instead of the spaces for youth increasing, they seem to be de depleting like our polar ice caps. Our voices seem as important as the issue of elephants being poached and trees being cleared, but seems like our voices cannot be heard just like theirs. We are the few like our endangered species, because our future is endangered. Our future is not promised unless we take action. But in order to take action, we need to be ensured active, meaningful engagement on high levels in the halls of power. We need to move from being the few in such rooms to being the many. We are the few because we are treated like the few, and we look as if we cannot bring much to the table when that is not the case. We talk a lot about sustainability here in the UN, but we miss out on the biggest resource of ensuring sustainability with the youth. Making reference to draft resolution 5.5, we call on the recognition of UNMGCY as a consultative status in all relevant preparation, planning, adoption, and implementation of work programs to achieve the objectives of the fourth session of of the UN Environment Assembly and to encourage intergenerational equity across existing platforms to ensure meaningful youth engagement in platforms that affect us. We are the few. The few are prepared. The few are informed. We are engaged. The few are empowered, who are listened to. The few are equipped, who are here. So help us be the many. Thank you. I thank the two youth, uh, Lily Jabkoe Tanvi and Paul Coffey Beborn for their eloquent voices. We have now come to the last presenter and I would like to call Mr. Yunus Awiken, representing local authorities. You have the floor. Mr. President, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegations, my name is Yunus Arikan from Ikle Local Governments for Sustainability, and I'm delivering this statement in my capacity as the co-facilitator of the Local Authorities Major Group. At the outset, I would like to recall that local and regional governments and their networks unite their voices to mourn all the lives lost in the tragic plane cr crash ahead of the UNA 4. The fourth UN Environment Assembly is gathering at a critical moment in time. 
Science calls for ambitious and accelerated action to meet 1.5 degree goals of the Paris Agreement. Heads of states are prepared to review progress towards the last decade of for 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and a new deal for nature is just starting to be drafted. At the same time, from the streets of metropolises to the forests of Amazons, new and innovative models of resistance and collaboration are evolving across borders and generations to defend livelihoods and develop a human civilization of sustainable lifestyles respecting planetary boundaries. Throughout UNEP governing councils, and six years ago, at the first UN Environment Assembly in 2013, local and regional governments urged for more active engagement with ministers of environment to seize the potential of the urban world in addressing challenges of sustainability. After all these years and efforts, I am delighted to announce you that at the same hours of today, the first ever city summit of the UN Environment Assembly is taking place with the engagement of ministers, mayors, governors, senior staff, and stakeholders across the world, thanks to the collaboration of ICLEI, Energy Foresty, UCLG, Global Task Force, UN Environment, UN Habitat, and Cities Alliance. We are also encouraged to observe growing number of resolutions in the UNA agenda that address urban issues. We would like to reiterate that local and regional governments and their networks are eager to offer their expertise and collaboration to UN Environment and UNA delegations in order to connect sustainable, integrated, urban and territorial development into the environment agenda. We therefore encourage this vision to be reflected into the future program of work of the UN Environment in order to fully seize the potential of the urban world. We also welcome the two passionate women leaders leading the UN institutions on environment and habitat and Nairobi as the excellent host of the two unique UN assemblies alongside the UN, and General, UN General Assembly. We are confident this holistic and multi-level collaboration will give confidence and hope to the citizens across nations that sustainable cities and regions are the custodians for the well-being of all humans and the planet Earth. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Avikin. We have now concluded our list of speakers for this session. We will adjourn the session and continue the national statements tomorrow afternoon at 3 p.m. in the same room. Before I ask the Secretariat if they would wish to make any comment, let me express my deep appreciation to all of you who have cooperated to make this session a productive one. And I hope as we proceed in the rest of the business at this conference, the productivity will continue to represent what we all have as our objectives. I now ask the Secretariat to make any housekeeping announcements that are necessary. Thank you, Chair. Um, we would just like to remind you, just like yesterday, that the, all the statements will be uploaded on the UNEA website, uh, the written version, as well as the uh, video statements. And just to rectify a minor mistake on our side is that the national statements tomorrow will be at 4 p.m. in the afternoon and not at 3 p.m. And uh, we hope to see many of you in the uh, high-level opening tomorrow morning at 11. Thank you, Chair. And thank you. I now declare the meeting adjourned.
Ladies and gentlemen, I want to make a brief announcement for those of you who are in the audience. The event uh, led by India will start in about five minutes. It celebrates World Environment Day 2018 and partnerships around the world for resource efficiency. Our VIPs are gathering and they'll be here in a few minutes, so please uh, stay with us. Thanks very much. Shannon, let's have the video. <laughs> 